Hello, welcome to the Theology Podcast. It's good to have you back. I'm C.R. Wiley. I'm a pastor. I serve a church at Pacific Northwest. I've written some books, the most recent being in the house of Tom Bombadil. And uh, that's enough about me. Uh, let's go to you, Glenn. I'm Glenn Sunshine, Senior Fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. Uh, my main job is as a ministry associate at Reflections Ministries, and I'm a retired history professor. Great. Tom? I'm Tom Price. I teach systematic theology, theological ethics, and philosophy. One of the places is Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. All right, great. Well, uh, it's my day today uh, for the podcast, and uh, I have a an article that we'll link in the show notes that comes from First Things Magazine. Now, First Things is a great magazine. There are certain magazines that every pugster should subscribe to. You know, you ought to subscribe to Touchstone. You ought to subscribe to First Things. I think you ought to subscribe to the American Spectator, but we'll give or take that one a little bit. I also think that, you know, uh, you know, the Claremont Review of Books is great. Maybe you guys have your own favorite you know, uh, you know, publication that you'd like to, to reference. Um, but definitely first things in touchstone. We've talked about a number of articles that are published in touchstone and now we we're dealing with one from first things. I can tell you're just itching to say something there, Glenn, go for it. No, <laughs> okay. <not really laughs> you just had that look on your face, <laughs> but, uh, sorry, first thing, the only face I got. <laughs> <laughs> first things is a, is a really significant journal. It's probably, uh, the place where serious socially conservative, uh, world-class Christian thinkers and even Jewish thinkers will publish. And, um, I, you know, it's not as though everything that's published in first things is something that really, you know, speaks to me, but, you know, I, I pretty much read it from cover to cover each, each, each time. And, um, this particular article by the sweat of our brow by Joshua Mitchell is just great. And as I noted, or I think I noted, uh, it's, it's in the show notes. So, uh, thank you to first things for making that available online because it was in the print magazine. And this is actually, uh, the uh, address that Mitchell gave to the uh, gathering in Washington, D.C. Uh, for their 2022 First Things lecture that was held there. Um, now, uh, he does a lot. It's a long article or it's a long address and he does a lot in it and we won't be able to do justice to it. But let me just kind of get us off uh, the starting blocks here with just a uh, sort of his opening. His opening is one in which he makes a contrast between kind of two schools of thought that have been significant in the, um, uh, it's sort of the socially conservative or just maybe conservative intellectual community. Um, and they have two, there are two kind of uh, giants of, uh, of, uh, you know, uh, influence when it comes to these t particular schools. One is Leo Strauss. Leo Strauss uh, was a philosopher, kind of focused mostly on, I guess, political philosophy. I think he taught at the University of Chicago. Uh, like a lot of those guys at the University of Chicago, um, you know, kind of a, I guess, uh, a kind of class. And um, he's had a s significant influence, particularly in the neoconservative world. So a lot of people who consider themselves conservative, but maybe have reconciled themselves to large government, uh, looked at Leo Strauss uh, as a source of inspiration and a person that informs their thinking. Um, I think he's he's written just a number of books on uh, the subject of natural right. Um, one of the things that he's known for is kind of his understanding of um, kind of the esoteric character of some of the great works in the Western canon. He, he really uh, was convinced that many of the things that, say, Plato said and other thinkers throughout the course of the, of the Western tradition, uh, they were speaking very uh, surreptitiously. They were speaking in a way that would sort of like get past the censors, you could say, and that consequently you have to have kind of an insight into what they were up to to kind of get their points. But uh, the other thinker, um, is Alistair McIntyre, who is, of course, famous for his great work, After Virtue. Um, 
McIntyre uh, was at was he at Notre Dame? I think he was at Notre Dame. He was he was, I think he was at Notre Dame. He was at Duke. He, the last he was at Duke when I was there. So I and I don't okay. remember. He re- ended up retiring from there, if I remember right. Okay, well, you know, I think a lot of folks are familiar with McIntyre because of his popularizers. Someone like Rod Dreher with you know his Benedict option. Uh, you know, he takes that last section. If I think it's the last section of uh, you know after virtue where he's, you know, kind of looking forward and saying that we'll need a new Benedict because we've entered a new dark age and we need somebody to preserve the, 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 I guess the, the corpus of our, of, you know, what's best in the West to kind of take us through and get out on the other side of this current darkness that we find ourselves in it, intellectually speaking. Now, what both uh, Strauss and McIntyre are speaking to is, um, What's the most significant thing when it comes to this sort of source material for us to think about the world? And uh, what you have with Strauss and McIntyre is nature, We're talking about human nature in particular. Uh, and this is in some sense fixed. This is like something that we can look at and say, this is what we are. And we can learn some lessons from this uh, study of, of human nature. And this study of human nature informs philosophy and every other uh, humane endeavor. The other uh, outlook is history. And we've talked about historicism several times in the course of the show. We're not against history. What we're, what we're, what we're uh, objecting to is the tendency by some people who believe that human beings have the power to self-create In other words, not in some secondary sense, but in the primary sense, that human nature is in some sense in flux and is the product of history. And that consequently, history as it unfolds uh, is uh, bringing about certain changes in human nature. And so consequently, we can't really talk about human nature as fixed. It's just kind of like you know, in process. And it depends on when we're, you know, what are we, what, what era we're talking about? So a lot of the time, you know, when, when people, uh, you know, address this, uh, phenomenon and they do it in a sort of, I guess, naive way, they'll say, you know, you're on the right side of history, meaning mm-hmm. that, uh, or the standards that you are advocating are passe. They belong to an earlier age. They may have been true once, but they're not true now because things are different now, including human nature has changed. And consequently, you know, that's why we can say that was something that maybe could be winked at or even permitted in the past, but is not acceptable at the moment. So you get, you get the idea. That's, that, that's, those are the contrasts. Any thoughts about, about sort of how uh, Mitchell starts off this conversation? Yeah, I just want to note that I'm grateful that you did acknowledge that we're not against history. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, history is a fact. <laughs> well, it's and, happened, and I and I think that's a, a good, good a good way to to uh, a good point to emphasize because I think what you have going on here is the difference between the classical world between sort of being and becoming, um, and that when you talk about the natures of, of things in in a kind of more that we have a certain essence or being. No matter what changes we have in the different periods of history, there is continuity that that identifies the kind of being and and creatures we are versus this historicism, which is sort of becoming where the discontinuity is much more characteristic of what we are is what we're what we are in different kind of setups in history the relations to all of the relativities of each moment that really give us our identity and our, and what we are versus something that is, is uh, true about us, uh, uh, the kind we are. Yeah. And that's, and this is why identity can be stable for us as conservatives. Right. So yeah. let me yeah. read one. One of the ahead, things Jim. that, you know, as a historian, one of the things that I tried to emphasize in my classes is that although we talk about discontinuity because it's interesting and it's something to talk about. The fact is that more things stay the same than change. In pretty much any any change in history, there's much more continuity than there is change. Most people don't recognize that. I have some questions about our era right now, but um, right, right. but for the rest of history, I would say that that that's 
that's pretty much a certainty. And that means it's probably also true now, although it's harder to see it in in light of the radical changes that are happening in, in ideology and culture right now. Well, one of the things I've tried to say, you know, to sort of convey to my students over the years is that is that change certainly is a fact. I mean, things change uh, and there is moral progress that that is possible. But often uh, it's not as open ended and uh, sort of realizable as maybe people assume and that there are trade offs. So in order to get certain things, you give up other things. Uh, And that means that at any given point in human history, maybe some things are, are at a good spot or a better spot than they have been in the past or, or, at, or, or are in the moment and vice versa. So like if we look at, say, American history, uh, we could say, yeah, there were lots of terrible things that occurred in the 19th century. I mean, we, we can think about slavery. We can think about, you know, what occurred with the Native Americans, the Indians, that kind of stuff. On the other hand, we can look at some other things and we can see, uh, you know, a lot of positive things that are occurring, you know, not just in uh, industry, but but even in terms of, uh, you know, sort of a, a more popular, I guess, regard for the elderly than we see today in terms of like the actual practice of caring for your elders as opposed to just handing them off to some institution or, you know, uh, you know, small town life and sort of the possibilities that it affords of actually getting to know people and working together. You know, we look at something like a barn raising today uh, among the Amish and we just are, are astonished and we and we admire that. Well, our ancestors, I mean, our ancestors did that kind of stuff. They didn't have to be Amish to do that. <laughs> that our ancestors actually did it for each other. So there are things that, you know, uh, we've gained, there are things that we've lost, and that's important to remember. But getting back to this question of human nature, I'd like to read a couple of paragraphs from this address by Mitchell to give you a little taste of what uh, you know he has to say. So this is on page 32 in terms of the print edition, not at, down at the end uh, or at the bottom in the first column. He says, uh, the recovery of human nature shielded conservatives against historicism what we just talked about, against relativism. With due respect to Alan Bloom, who in The Closing of the American Mind, published in 1987, which, by the way, was a good book and you ought to read it, <laughs> argued that relativism was the modern menace. Our problem today is not relativism, but identity politics, which seeks to transform all human relations and all our actions into a righteous crusade to purge the world of stain. The German problem, our europhilic political theorists and theologians claim, gave us relativism. We are not in Europe. We are in America. The exception, the new beginning, to what domains does American exceptionalism pertain? Politics alone? Social conditions? Religion? If the latter, uh, if the latter was, the, was Tocqueville, the first to propose the American exceptionalism thesis in democracy in America, 1835, right to associate the Puritans with the new beginning. If so, might say the first great awakening illuminate the contemporary identity politics crisis more uh, than do the writings of Strauss, McIntyre, and Bloom, which focus on the crisis of modernity in Europe. Okay, so now we're going into some directions that I think that some of our Reformed listeners are starting to feel a little uncomfortable with. (laughs) Today, uh, he goes on to say, a a a uh, puritanical, uh, it's not puritanical, but puritaniacal, uh, yearning to work out the economy of innocence and transgression, what spiritual debt do transgressors owe, and to whom haunts the conscience of America. No nation escapes its origins. We are living through another great American awakening, this time without God and without forgiveness. Identity politics is the unholy ghost of Puritanism, whose object is of cathartic rage, is the white heterosexual man of whom the Puritan preachers of old are irredeemable instances. I mean, there's just so much going on with those two paragraphs. It's just great. We could, uh, we could have a whole show just on kind of unpacking what he said. There. A quick a quick question. Is Joshua Mitchell related to Mark Mitchell? 
I don't know. I I, I don't think so. Okay, Mark Mitchell he, did, is done. he did the forward to his book with Patrick Deneen, the book Mark Mitchell did, Power and Purity, which gets into the way in which the puritanical and the social justice come together. So I was just curious if that was a kind of, there's a kind of mindset going on there, but there's a lot there. I mean, it's... Well, maybe, maybe it's, they don't look alike. I know Mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's, he's down at Patrick Henry. Yeah. And... Uh, and uh, Joshua is at Georgetown. Yeah. Um, but I think um, there's certainly, I, I agree with you. I mean, that, that those things are, and I know Deneen would be all over what Mitchell is saying. Here. Yeah, yeah. 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 I know, I know Patrick too. Go ahead. Yeah. The, the interesting thing is I've heard the Me Too movement described as, as a kind of secularized neo-Puritanism. Right. Um, I've heard that. But I'm really intrigued by his. He doesn't. He, he the the article doesn't even go there, or the the essay. The, the right. speech this is just a setup. This is just a setup. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, but 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 his version of neo puritanism, I think, is a whole lot more powerful uh, because oh, yeah. it it does explain the shift to. You know, uh, well, a guilt and innocence culture right. where um, there are people who are guilty and there are others that are innocent. And there is and now it's, it's a tad more complicated than that because we've got to add intersectionality into this. Yeah. But if you are a guilty party, you are a guilty party because you are part of a group that is guilty. Okay. Whatever you have or have not done is irrelevant. Yeah. And thus, as he says, there is no redemption here, unlike in Puritanism. Puritanism is actually far oh, yeah. gentler than this is. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't think he's he's critiquing Puritanism per se. Oh, no, I know he isn't. I, absolutely. Yeah. But in the popular mind, the Puritans were really harsh and judgmental right. and all of that sort of thing. Actually, they come across as cream puffs compared to what's going on right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I that's guess one of the things that he points out. Yeah, I think I think the thing that I see in something like this neo-Puritan moment, and he's not the only person, and Deneen's not the, and you know, and, and Mark, mm -hmm. uh, the, I've heard this in other places um, that what you have is this sort of uh, crusading. Uh, well, what he gets at this this quest for purity, uh, and in order to achieve that purity something has to die blood has to be spilt so there's, there's something that has to, be, to there's a sacrifice that needs to be made to cleanse the stain of sin uh but because there's no transcendence because there is no son of god because there is no vicarious sacrifice mm -hmm. because there is no uh forgiving lawgiver uh that makes the neo-Puritanism of the moment, which has these superficial similarities to Puritanism, you know, in the past, uh, very dangerous. I mean, it's just horrifically dangerous. Gen genocidal, uh, I think he uses the term. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, and it's a, this is a deep psychological uh, uh, sort of uh, religious movement. Is, you know, that's what he, I think that's what he's getting at. He's, he's wanting to get us to the place where we can say, that what we're dealing with right now is a religious phenomenon uh, that is, uh, yes, secular, yes, materialistic, but is the is kind of the bastard child of Puritanism, and it's and I think that that connection is not unfair. I think that if you if you did a a deep dive and sort of traced uh, kind of the genealogy of influence, you would get back to the Puritans in New England. Yeah. Uh, with with a lot of this stuff, um, obviously, it, you know, with all of the, uh, you know, religious or uh, theological components, the, you know, sort of this other dimension expunged, but everything else is there. And I think it's very important to keep the religious language in there in in explicating what's going on here because i do fundamentally think it is uh, it is a false spirituality and therefore morality that is that is driving it 
Um, but you have all the things that a false spirituality and false morality have with them, the same things Christ oftentimes condemns the Pharisee for, right? When you do all the same things and benefit the same way, yet you are going to condemn this person here. And, you know, you, you know, that you think somehow you escape the, the realm of condemnation, you, you throw the first stone. Um, but, but again, it, you have hierarchies of what your of people can be guilty of. So if they're guilty of privileging in any way whatsoever, uh, to which someone else was disadvantaged, that's something that is a, that's worth, you know, beating someone up, stealing from, or even killing. If they've done that, you're, you're allowed to, because you have been oppressed by, you know, th this kind of thing. But I think the other thing is, I think where a lot of us have been caught off guard, not us, but a lot of people are, especially even in the church, is the way in which this does sell itself as if it is a secular and a philosophical and a scientific, social scientific uh, analysis. And I need to back up a little and remind those from the social science and the science school who, who stuck into my head over and over again that those are descriptive, not uh, prescribing tasks. And they always want to say we can use it as an analytical tool to analyzing, but they're always moving it directly to prescribing for us exactly in reality how it is and how we need to behave. And so they've entered the realm of the moral and therefore the spiritual and therefore the religious by shifting from the descriptive task to telling us what we need to be doing and how we need to see reality. But that's how they always operate. That's right. <laughs> I've never met a scientist who wasn't a, a closet uh, preacher. But yeah. Anyway, I, I, you have anything you want to add there, Glenn? I've got something I want to I, I, I kind of follow up with from from Mitchell. But anything you wanted to say? Yeah the the nature the the religious nature of what's going on um, has been evident ever since the BLM riots have taken place. Um, you, I've I've compared a lot of what happened afterwards to uh, struggle sessions from China. Yeah, but even even those have a quasi religious outlook to them, where people are trying to expiate their sins. The problem is, depending on which version of critical theory or identity politics you're using, expiation is impossible. I found it's it's, it's, it's exorcism, you could say. Yeah, e either either the person is possessed by the bourgeois capitalist outlook and that needs to be exercised or the person is irredeemable and needs to be destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, fun functionally, mm. um, you know, this is, um, uh, Kendi and others. If you're white, you're racist. Period. Right. Right. Yeah. But the other thing that I thought was interesting in this article, and you may be getting there is this discussion of scapegoating. Yeah. I was just about to, to, to read something. Okay, I'll toss it back to you then. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. So here's a. This is from page thirty-three at the bottom and the and the left uh, column. He says, "Conservatives have yet to understand fully that identity politics is a spiritual quest." Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the reasons why young people are so drawn to it. Mm -hmm. The are romantics at heart. They want to be. Uh, they want to do the right thing. They want to. They want to change the world. They want it to be a better mm -hmm. place. All that kind of stuff. And and all those things are good. Let me go back to his comments, uh, which draws its tropes, the scapegoat, the voiceless, innocent victim, irredeemable stain from Christianity, while at the same time seeking to do away with Christianity as it has historically been understood. What we need is there, uh, what we need, what we need is there for the divine scapegoat, Jesus Christ, who takes away the sins of the world when a moral, a mortal scapegoat, can, uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me read that again. What do we need, therefore, the divine scapegoat, Jesus Christ, who takes away the sins of the world, when a mortal scapegoat can serve that purpose in an America still enthralled by Christian tropes, but no longer really Christian? So, therefore, purge the white heterosexual male and all that he has wrought, Westphalia, capitalism, fossil fuels, the American Constitution, the heteronormative family, the homophobic church, scientific rationalism, yada, yada, yada. You know, <laughs> we've, we've all uh, heard that before. Anyway, but that gets to what you were saying there, Glenn. Yeah. 
And then later, he gives a list of the achievements of the of white heterosexual male. <laughs> That's right. And That's right. Note, now this is this is where it gets interesting for me. He notes that none of these matter. Yeah. And at that point, what we are is we're back in Christian theology. No matter how many good works you do, at the end of the day, you are still a sinner. Mm -hmm. And you still need salvation. You cannot achieve salvation by all the good things you've done. That's right. So what we have here is an identity politics, secular Christianity. And a kind of Judaizing. Without redemption. Yeah. yeah, and a Judaizing factor if you take in the food laws. <laughs> you yeah, think about yeah, veganism yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And the speech it's, laws, it's, right? <laughs> yeah, and the speech laws. And these are all things that make you unclean, morally unclean. Um, and, it, and the data is out there to tell you that most of this stuff just has no scientific basis or it's actually harmful. I was just – last night I was watching a, a YouTube video on protein. And, the, and basically the, the, the gist of the, of the presentation is that – uh, all proteins are not interchangeable. I mean, they're not fungible. You know, uh, what you get from lentils is not the same thing as you get from eggs. In fact, if uh, you really want to have the best sources of protein, the protein that's easiest to digest and use and to be health and, and to, to, to maintain good health. And by the way, you need a lot of protein. I was kind of astonished at how much protein you actually need just to, you know, be healthy. Um, it's all from the, from animal sources, dairy, meat, that kind of stuff. All of the the uh, vegetable based proteins are far down the list when it, term, when it terms to the benefits. Now, in order to get the same benefits, you got to meet just a tremendous amounts of that stuff <laughs> if you're going to acquire the same benefits that you enjoy. And then with supplements, because there are certain things about uh, you know animal based proteins that just cannot be that are just don't belong in that properties of. In other words, you've got to eat animals in some way if you're going to be healthy um i i saw a meme yesterday that had a photo of a hippopotamus on it and it <laughs> said the hippopotamus teaches us that you that eating a vegetarian diet and walking is no way to lose weight <laughs> <laughs> furthermore uh some of some I, you know you, have you seen these uh, videos where you've got angry hippopotami attacking people <laughs> there, it's there, not like these be yeah, they're the most dangerous animal in Africa. They kill more people than crocodiles. Yeah, by yeah, they're, a significant percent. Yeah, they're or not nice. Or anything else. Yes, and they're, and they're vegetarians. Yeah, well, you know, I, I suspect a lot of us, if we were forced into a vegetarian diet, it might drive us into homicide. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Anyway, uh, so you know, he talks about that particular sort of feature to American life. Then he jumps into sort of recent political trends. Uh, he, he has this marvelous section on Trump derangement syndrome, uh, <laughs> where, you know, basically, you know, uh, the inquisitor, uh, you know, asks you, have you ever, you know, do you renounce Trump and all of his works? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like Trump, Trump derangement sy syndrome became the baptismal right of the Church of the New American Awakening. Do you announce Satan? Yes, I do. <laughs> now, I, I thought his analysis of why Trump derangement syndrome exists was really interesting, too. Very interesting. Yeah, so, yeah I summarized that, Glenn. Well, in, in essence, Trump represented everything that the, the left has been fighting against, the so-called progressives. Everything that they were opposed to was embodied by Donald Trump. And as a result, they went absolutely berserk. Because how could this guy possibly be elected when he's the antithesis of everything we enlightened folks stand for? And, and, not, and not only that, he was completely immune to he's every tactic. <laughs> He, 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 he's not suffering from the guilt in that. That's one of the things he notes. That's Here key, comes yeah. someone who complete, he, and he's, he's like pouring <laughs> kerosene. And for them, he, he's playing right in, see, because they interpret everything from identity politics. Here comes the ultimate white supremacist, right? Pouring, right. it's not how much he actually has done for everybody positively, economically, that doesn't matter. Because here again, is someone from the group of sin and stain and how even if they even if they brought the kingdom of god for all the marginalized and the broken and the hurt 
he would still represent this evil you know, yeah, you know Tr Trump was able to point at the the employment numbers for Black America, and he'd say, "Hey, Black America Everyone's loves doing great. Yeah, er, Black America loves Trump." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can remember him saying stuff like that, and just yeah, if, if and I knew a lot of Black Americans who did. <laughs> yeah, that's right. If he's a racist, he's the most unsuccessful one in history in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But that's right. but th but that the fact that he was there was no guilt, no apology, nothing like that. And the fact <laughs> of the matter is, look, the guy is a narcissist. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm yeah, not I mean, there, there, are, there are net, there are liabilities here, but yeah. it, it was particularly the fact that he was unapologetic about <laughs> any of this stuff <laughs> that drove him crazy. Oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. Now, uh, what he does at this point is he says, "Okay, this is the situation we find ourselves in," and we all are just laughing, you know, as we recognize people who have been colleagues, or friends you know, maybe even enemies, <laughs> you know, in this, this in this sort of uh, uh, framework that he's presented. But he gets into some things that are really, I think, worth thinking about because of their practical implications. And he um, gets into uh, the nature of uh, mediating institutions and how they promote competency. So kind of in the background, uh, he plays out sort of uh, Tocqueville's scenario of, you know, or maybe the, the warning that Tocqueville, uh, you know, gives in Democracy in America, where he says, you know, Tocqueville, because of, of the American, I guess, uh, confidence in the democratic project, uh, there's a kind of blindness to a couple of things. One is, you need a competent citizen in order for the system to actually work well. And if you don't have a competent citizen, then you need experts who are kind of running everything to make certain that the incompetent citizen doesn't harm himself or at least to harm other people. And in the history of the United States, you can kind of look at different epics or different phases and sort of the, the phase that we that we see in you know the colonial era up through say um you know the gilded age is the competence model where they, the the uh, uh, you know sort of the the notion is that citizens are competent to conduct their own affairs uh participate in the political process you know the the ideal is the town meeting you can see that norman rockwell painting with the the working class man standing up at the town meeting to speak his mind. That's mm. the, the ideal of the founders. But then uh, in the progressive era, the progressive era sort of straddling the 19th into the 20th centuries with people like Woodrow Wilson and uh, Teddy Roosevelt, as much as I like Teddy in so many, in certain ways, in other ways, he was just horrendous. Um, what you have in the, sort of rising to the surface at that time is the expert class, the, the sort of the professional, uh, you know, sort of expert, the bureaucrats uh, and who uh, are the smartest people in the room. What we need to do is just let, let leave the driving to them. They'll uh, take care of everything. And then we can kind of go back to our own small concerns and leave the government to them. And so what we uh, find ourselves, you know, in now is something much more, along that line. Uh, and what you have is a kind of, I guess, process in which, uh, you know, it's sort of like, uh, the justification for the, uh, the authorities, uh, these, this expert class is that people are not competent to conduct their, you know, sort of their, you know, run their own lives and, uh, govern their own communities. Therefore we need to do that for them. Um, through whatever agency it is, um, you know, health and human services, the Department of Education, whatever. Uh, but uh, the, Chris, go ahead. can I jump in here? Sure. One of, one of the things that people don't typically realize is that political and economic systems parallel each other. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because they're both based on assumptions about natural human relations. So, Feudalism was accompanied by manorialism. They're frequently confused, but they're two different things. Feudalism is political, manorialism is economic. Republicanism is, 
unparalleled by free market economics. Socialism is paralleled by technocracy, by technocrats, by expert government. And it's no accident that when we start moving toward this um, expertise on the part of, well, experts, competent, ex competence, as he, he calls it, of experts and relying on them to make the decisions, it's no accident that the government begins taking over more and more control of the economy because right. it's an inevitable result. A thing I think it was, uh, and I, 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 I track with you and I agree with you. I think the thing, though, that that he brings out that I'd like to focus on mm -hmm. is how this undermines the very capacity for competent self-government. Yeah. So on the one hand, the expert class justifies their role by noting that, uh, that they know things that other people don't and uh, people are not competent to run their own affairs. But one of the reasons why people are not competent to run their own affairs is because somebody's doing all the work for them. Right. So I'm, I'm going to get us something to drink here, but you guys go ahead and talk while I'm uh, okay. doing that. All right. Yeah. Well, where I want to go right away is Machiavelli. And we talked about this on an earlier show. Machiavelli, contrary to popular opinion of the guy, was actually a Republican. Hmm. He believed Florence, where he lived, uh, ought to be a republic. But the hmm. problem is... In order, everybody from the ancient world forward up through the American Revolution and beyond, new republics only worked when the citizenry had virtue. Hmm. And so Machiavelli thought Florence ought to be a republic, but he said it's at best a sick republic. Yeah. So what we need to do is restore virtue to the republic. And the way we restore virtue is through institutions. Yeah. You, we, we, you know, he was appealing to the prince, to the Medici, to revitalize Florence's institutions so that they would be able to produce virtuous citizens so that when the Medici died or retired, they would be able to hand the government over a, as a republic, a functioning republic. And by so doing, they'd get everlasting glory and all that kind of thing. But the interesting thing about this is it parallels exactly what, what the, this piece is talking about, that you need these institutions to develop, well, he calls it competence, Machiavelli called it virtue, to develop the kind of citizenry that you need in order to have a functioning republic. And that's, and, and that's where he was talking exactly what today, what today they're doing is they're developing not virtue, but virtue signaling. <laughs> and, and then what is going on? And I think he mentions this, and this is probably where you're going to go, is that, I mean, when he talked about the different ways in which, uh, you know, progressives, for example, in the expert class came in, what you're starting to see is with, with the identity politics class, by, by merely virtue signaling, they're promoting the incompetent, and it, it is completely, I think maybe this is where you were going with, uh, starting to dismantle the functioning of these institutions. Yeah, yeah. We've all talked about kind of ad nauseum the incompetence of many young people. There, there's a, a, a sort of a, a sad thing we can observe. There, There's, you know, great, I guess, uh, prowess uh, playing call of duty <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on whatever platform you play it on, but, uh, no physical competence with actually handling a weapon in real life or actually doing the physical things that you are simulating in the game. Okay. Um, quick, quick, quick interruption. Sure. I'm in Indiana. <laughs> this is where the most recent mall shooting or it took okay. place. Yeah. 22. Now think about this. 22-year-old kid, in, the guy comes out of the bathroom and he starts shooting. In 15 seconds, he's down. 22-year-old kid across the food court, apparently 50 yards away, pushes his girlfriend into a safe position, draws, and starts walking toward the guy opening fire with his pistol. Ten shots, eight hit. That's okay. Good. So how old is, how old is this guy? 22. Okay. His girlfriend is a nurse. She's following him, applying first aid. Once the gunman is down, he applies first aid. 
you know, why don't we why don't we produce more people like this? Well, and the fact that that we that we have in this particular instance is worth thinking about. And I'd like to know a little more about those two people um, mm-hmm. because they're obviously an exception or exceptional mm-hmm. people. Um, and that's what he's getting at with this piece. He's he's he's, he's, he's saying that there was a time where we had more people like that. Right. And so I guess the good news is, and this is really worth thinking about, is that maybe sometimes we uh, are are not attuned to some of the exceptional people that we still have. Uh, Mm -hmm. We're not uh, adequately aware. And I I know in the circles that I uh, travel in, I've got a a lot of young people I know that I I think have got their acts together and uh, are doing great. And... And I think he, I think on that article, he kind of hints that it's it, the reason we don't see so many of them because they're the ones holding the world up for everyone else. <laughs> so, yeah, right. yeah let, let, me, let me read this, this portion yeah. that gets into that because he does, he, he makes this contrast. Yeah. He says, uh, and he actually ties this into the democratic solitude and sort of this problem that we face that Tocqueville was describing. So he, he actually pulls things together, I think, in a very insightful way. So he says here, this is on page 37, how does this democratic solitude allow identity politics parishioners uh, to ignore the ongoing need for competence? Imagine a group of college students who live in a dormitory designed for women and transgender persons. Uh, The radiators must be replaced if the students are to stay warm through the winter. The work is successfully performed an outrage erupts among the students who feel that side gender workmen have violated their safe space. Quote, they should have performed this service over the summer when we were away, end of quote, the students declare. This need not be imagined. It happened on the Oberlin campus this past October, and it is not an isolated incident. Segregation in America today is not racial. It is imposed uh, along uh, uh, along new lines, which uh, a 21st century Ralph Ellison has yet to lay bare. 19 out of, tw- uh, of 20 dirty jobs in America, infrastructure building and maintenance, are performed by side gendered indivis- uh, invisible men. And he's, he's, you know, he's got invisible men capitalized to tie in Ellison, mm-hmm. um, who construct the disinclusionary social spaces within which identity politics parishioners convince themselves that intersectional scores matter and competence does not. Mm -hmm. Safe spaces from side gender men are built almost entirely by side gender men. (laughs) So, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about this before, but uh, you see it all the time. Like here, I'm in here in the Pacific Northwest there's a lot of construction uh, that's going on. And as you drive through a place like Portland or Seattle, and I do it all the time, uh, there are two things that you see or two communities. There are the homeless people, and I put homeless in quotes because a lot of these people who uh, are living on the streets have homes. They just don't uh, see the uh, – they, they're, just, they're just not welcome them anymore because they've uh, stolen the rent money one too many times or whatever. And now they're on the street living in a tent. So you'll see a lot of that. But the other uh, community that you see, and there are thousands of them, are all men in yellow vests. And what are they doing? They're building the roads. They're building the new skyscrapers. They're doing all the maintenance work. They're, they're there by the thousands – in downtown Portland, downtown Seattle, but it's almost like he says they're invisible. No one acknowledges the debt that we owe to the to these guys uh, for the work that they perform. And he and he has a he has a brilliant. Uh, I think it's a, a kind of one liner, and I, I did write it down somewhere. But he he said. Um, Marcuse uh, worried that Marxism would never take hold if capitalism kept producing goods. The identity politics awakening will falter when truckers refuse to deliver them. And I think it's that point. When, when it's actually the ones who are beaten up on and, and, and actually uh, treated horribly for everything except for what they do for everyone else, when that group decides it's not going to do it for anyone else, there goes the rest. Yeah. I wrote a piece uh, a few years back after the Trump election 
in which uh, I was re- sort of responding to or reacting to a, an opinion piece that I'd actually stumbled across in which some guy was, uh, you know, commiserating the fact that that when the plumber came to his house to repair whatever needed repairing, the guy spoke with a Southern accent and, <laughs> and this guy was afraid that he probably voted for Trump and he felt threatened by his, by his very presence in his home. And, it's, and of course, in my, my response to this, this piece, I mocked the guy and, you know, uh, reflected upon the many plumbers I've known over the years who could care less what your politics are. They just want yeah. to do the job and get paid and go home. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but it, just the, the, the fact that such an in, sort of idiotic piece could be written and published in some, I guess, online journal, maybe it was even uh, something that came in print, I can't recall, just uh, was something that I had to, to re- respond to, react to. I mean, I remember back when uh, that whole... Um Russia Gate, everything was going through, and the uh, Peter Struck. I don't you know if you remember that character, but he was one of the ones involved in the FBI that was being questioned because he was sending uh, information, I guess, to keep promoting this kind of Russia Gate Trump's involvement to his his uh, his paramour um, Lisa Page, or I don't I don't remember the name, but anyway, he was being. You, there's a little clip that goes around of him during an interview where they were questioning him, and you can just see in his face the utter disgust he has for normal American people or anyone who would even have a thought of thinking Trump could make their life better, just a, as someone who who knows how to negotiate or whatever. And I mean the utter disgust and and you kind of sense this with the this group that likes to um identify with progressive radical politics that they're on the forefront somehow of of knowledge and in this you know esoteric you know superior society and that anyone who is from a place that could have voted differently is just to be repulsed and looked at you know uh as the you know subhuman if you will well, the thing that I'd like to focus on for for a little while at this point uh, in our conversation is this connection between competence and mediating institutions. So uh, what is a mediating institution? A uh, family is a mediating institution. Uh, a church is a mediating institution. Um, a neighborhood association, a baseball team, um, you know, your uh you know, corner bar where you hang out with some guys on Friday night. What 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 we're uh, sort of acknowledging when we talk about mediating institutions is that you have it th- at the sort of extremes, the individual all alone at one end, and the governing authorities who have the power of the state at the other. And in between these two, there are these different institutions that mediate, that sort of come between the extremes. And it's those mediating institutions that really kind of provide the structure of, to our lives. And the problem that we face is that there are people at, you know, either end who don't like those institutions because at one end, the individuals think that, oh, these, is, these, these, you know, people just get in the way of my my, uh, my, my goals, you know, I want to do this or that. And in this particular town, you know, they've got these rules about, you know, nobody walking around naked in public. Well, I think that's just oppressive. I, I should have the freedom to walk around naked. And, uh, you know, this local, you know, neighborhood association, it's, you know, on my case about wearing clothes is oppressing me. And then you have the other extreme, you know, people in the, you know, sort of the halls of government, these authorities who, you know, say, hey, you know, that's our job here. We're here to help you realize your freedom. You know, tell us who's oppressing you. Oh, it's that that neighborhood association that requires people to wear clothes. (laughs) Hey, you know, uh, we know what to do with those folks. You know, just, you know, file suit and, uh, you know, we can we can address this. So. There's a kind of symbiot- weird symbiotic relationship between these extremes. The paradox is that in the name of freedom, 
totalitarian is sort of totalitarianism is developing at the at the far extreme and everything in between in between is being leveled mm-hmm. it's losing its ability to govern itself and it's within those mediated institutions that people develop competencies and what do we mean by that well think about this example um that uh we see in the news that glenn noted somewhere this young man learned how to shoot a gun Somewhere this young woman learned how to take care of people who were, you know, hurt. So uh, where did that happen? Some government program? Highly unlikely. Uh, Did it happen in their public school? I have a hard time believing that, knowing what I know about public schools. There was probably in each case, you know, some kind of connection that they had to a shooting club in the instance of the boy. Maybe his father was a hunter. It was his grandfather. Oh, His really? grandfather taught him to shoot. And by the way, the reason why I gave the distance, that's almost impossible. Oh, I, yeah. I've, read, I've read military guys who said, I've won marksmanship awards and I couldn't have done that. Oh, yeah. yeah. If anybody who's spent any time with a gun, I've, I've got several guns. I've got handguns. Yeah, I mean, that's very impressive. Um, mm-hmm. you, you, uh, you know, if you've spent, if the only, only exposure you've had to guns is, is Clint Eastwood and John Wayne. You have no idea what, what's involved with shooting a gun. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, but yeah, the, it was grandfather. So it's the family as the intermediate institution. Yeah. So I would imagine it was something similar in the case of the girl. Uh, if she's yeah, she was in a nursing program, as I understand it. So yeah. it might have come from there. Yeah. But again, this is probably some kind of local community uh, college, maybe that she learned uh, at, or maybe a, a, a maybe even a state uh, school. But the point is, is that you've got this other institution and it's within these institutions that we learn how to conduct our lives and even just do some really basic things like, well, be a friend. You know, it's within the context of a friendship that we learn, you know, things that we need to know with regard to just basic virtues. I, I think that point is one of the things that a lot of young people are desperate for is genuine friendship that they're not getting at, at through, for example, school in much because they're exacerbating the differences and, and the, the fact that people shouldn't be relating if they're not of the same, you know, group. Um, and so I know a lot of young people that are absolutely desperate for friendship, and we don't realize how significant those, those institutions uh, have been, church and others, for that. Glenn? Right. One of the, the, one of the things that is... is perhaps an unfortunate habit for me, is I try to, I invert things in my head quite regularly. (laughs) It turns out that the progressives have their own version of mediating institutions, but they're mediating institutions whose intent is to push power back to the government and away from the individual. Um, This is the effect of groups like BLM, Antifa, uh, and a whole host of others. They want to disempower people and empower the government to impose their version of, of what a good world looks like. Um, you can look at PETA. You can look at um, various and some environmental groups. You can, there, are there any number of these whose, whose express purpose is really to disempower the individual? Right. I think that you know, getting back to this whole matter of, okay, this is the situation that we find ourselves in. How do we, you know, sort of what's the, what's the way forward? Um, I've got a, I've got a uh, paragraph I'd like to read uh, that's on page 39 of the print version that uh, deals with Strauss and McIntyre and some of the things that we're talking about here. Um, he says, I concede with Strauss and McIntyre that in the absence of an understanding of human nature, relativism will be a temptation. When all things are possible, all things will be tried. But by what authority shall our understanding of human nature be established so that we may be saved? The Bible? How well is that worked out? The Roman Catholic Church? Same question. Philosophy? In the long aftermath of the Enlightenment, Marx, Nietzsche, Freud, Heidegger, and Derrida uh, declared for us that philosophy is and always was, but a pretext for masking dark motivations that now must be exposed. Class consciousness, the animal in man who is man, the id, uh, ontological evasion, logocentrism, etc. So 
he's basically saying, okay, where do we turn, you know, in light of all this? And I think what he's trying to say is that we need uh, kind of a uh, recovery, uh, not just of nature uh, and, uh, you know, sort of uh, sources of authority, you know, meaning God, tradition, whatever, but also these mediating institutions need to be revived within which people learn how to do the things that need to be done to make the world work. Um, so he, he talks about a problem that he refers to as substitutism. Do you remember that where he gets into, uh, our tendency to replace what's, uh, important with something else that was intended originally to supplement, but in, in the, in the long run actually ends up s- sort of supplanting, yeah. uh, the thing that it's intended to supplement. So, uh, uh I guess he wrote a book entitled American Awakening. He says, in American Awakening, I named this illness substitutism and identified opioid addiction, plastic water bottle consumption, fast food mania, declining birth rates amid growing sexual fixations, social media obsession, online shopping madness, the rabbit push to virtual education, infantile uh, dependence on Google Maps. I am indicted here. Uh, Hmm. Digital entrancement, uh, di- uh, government overreach, immigration confusion, and the crisis of fiat currency as instances of this illness. I would now add that having pets increasingly is a substitute for having <laughs> children. So these things that were intended initially to supplement our lives uh, uh, is sort of in, sort of uh, sort of enrich them uh, in a very uh, strange and uh, very bad way, uh, supplant the things that they were intended to supplement. They substitute for them. Uh, and that, uh, is also the case when it comes to competence. We, we see sort of the, the undermining of competence, uh, through, uh, many of the things that were intended to make our lives better. Meaning obviously the sort of the pro the, the, the sort of the program of the progressives. Uh, as it's found its way, you know, sort of has been worked out, not just in you know, the world, the realm of government, but in high tech, big business, et cetera. Um, so I, I remember one time uh, I came across this, this gal um, and she was commiserating, uh, not being able to uh, um, find a uh, kind of an instant dinner kind of uh, solution to uh, her need to have dinner. And somebody suggested to her that she could like make dinner from scratch. And she was like, you mean MacGyver dinner? <laughs> In other words, remember the show MacGyver, you know, the <laughs> idea that, you know, basically this idea that you could actually make something, uh, you know, that wasn't pre sort of measured and sort of <laughs> concocted in such a way that any idiot could do it <laughs> was beyond cons- sort of uh, the realm of uh, legitimate expectation. You should not expect me to be able to do this. That's like MacGyver <laughs> or something. <laughs> My daughter, by the way, is the MacGyver of food. She can make just about anything from scratch. But yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was something that was very common. You know, lots and lots of people could do that stuff. But it's hard to find people today who can't. You, I mean, you see that a lot, I think, with with crafts and, and, and other things. Um, I mean, I'm still glad to hear children are still taking music lessons, you know, um, keeping their hands on instruments. Um, I doubt there are as many people learning how to make musical instruments, um, uh, you know, other than just kind of the factory reproduced stuff, which, which, you know, increasingly they're getting better and better, but they aren't. They aren't the same. Um, but the point of all of that is that I, I think none of this stuff is detached from our formation um, and the kind of cultivation that's that's needed uh, socially, not just uh, individually, to make society work. And, and I think that that is that kind of craftsmanship is missing in institutional um, form and training. I mean, you think of what, what are you getting teachers in, in the university? What are they doing with teachers? How are they crafting them um, to basically become ideological warriors and right and counselors? OK, there is a place for the counseling aspect. But are they carrying out their kind of role within that institution the way that's healthy for for society later? Um, I, I, I think, again, I think the what, what's being spit out of these institutions isn't looking good. Yeah. And I think, um, and I think what he's implying here 
uh, is not that there was necessarily malevolence uh, at yeah. work in these things, although I think in some cases there, that was the case. But yeah. what we end up with is a, a situation where we have kind of a, a lowering of standards, a lowering of competence. Um, you know, just the other day I posted something on Facebook uh, essentially describing my life as a 20-year-old in my first master's program. Uh, in which I, you know, noted that after I got out of class, uh, I jumped into my truck with, and, and and so did a bunch of other guys. And we went out to the work sites. We were we, you know, we worked we worked construction. We were framers and deck builders and stuff. And uh, each of us were studying for the ministry or academic careers. In fact, I was I, just because I posted that I, I I thought about one of the guys I knew from that you know from the the crew that I was on, and he's now a theologian at a at a seminary <laughs> in the Midwest and. And uh, it looks a lot different than he did. <laughs> but I'm sure if you were to look at me, you would say the same thing. <laughs> but and then I posted a picture of myself. This is what I, this is what I looked like when I was, you know, in my, my mid-20s. Yeah. And, and people were like, kind of like, wow. I was like, that was like normal. <laughs> yeah. people, people back in the, in the 80s, you know, you could, you could you know, you know, parse your Greek and swing a hammer. It's just hard yeah. to imagine anybody being able to do both these days. Now I know that yeah. there are guys out there, but yeah. Well, but I think in a lot of a lot. I mean, I know from you know just socioeconomic. I mean, I had to when I was doing my graduate work at work as well. I mean, I did teach guitar. But I remember working for a painting crew in the summers in North Carolina. <laughs> And, and, uh, you know, getting up at, you know, the days that you weren't in class, you're getting up at four o'clock in the morning and carrying huge buckets and working on your knees all day. And then having to go work on Greek at night when you're exhausted and dead. <laughs> and then not, not knowing if you could even see straight the next day when you had the test. Um, but I, I, I think that, you know, I mean, you could, I, I have heard stories. I don't know the history of this, but even early, Oftentimes, farmers in early America, especially in some of these Puritan contexts, could be out plowing and reading Greek at the same time, the New Testament in the Greek at the same time. And it is, it is amazing what we're capable of when we, when we allow these um, kinds of things to cultivate us and, and, and to push ourselves to this kind of competence, um, to be... I mean, one thing I, you know, you could give, uh, if you know much about the history of just uh, the routines of Thomas Jefferson, for example, and here's not someone who, who is, is, uh, I would, I would talk much about in terms of his theological emphasis, but well, here's even a guy his, even, who, his, even his moral purity. <laughs> that's right. And moral, moral purity. And, and uh, yeah, and his, <laughs> but on the other hand, here's a person who woke up with rigorous discipline, worked through various languages before the sun was even up, um, developed machines so that he could transcribe every letter he wrote so he had several copies of it, invested in all this li library and this other stuff. And, of course, the, the negative side, he ran a plantation. Of course, the, 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 you know, there was on the, on the managerial side, there was all kinds of skill required. Um, but then the ethical side became, a, you know, an issue, a course of, of he was also he was also in terrible debt most of the time. People don't realize it. <laughs> yeah, that, that, they a lot of them over invested. And they all, they were all fascinated with France. I mean, that was the you know he was over there all the time. Um, and actually, of which is kind of small note, but I, I just realized this: the the branch of Monticello that they have here in Connecticut has a portion of the French library that was Jefferson's from the oh. original. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. I'll have to check it out yeah. next time I'm back. Yeah, there. yeah. yeah. Anyway, we should probably start to pull this in for a landing. Anything you wanted to say, Glenn, as we do? Um, this is an incredibly rich article. I just encourage everybody to read it. We could spend multiple episodes on this and yeah. still not exhaust it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, anyway, uh, as we kind of wrap things up, I just want to say thank you to all the folks who are our uh, patrons on Patreon. Thank you for signing up. We've got a growing list there. And if uh, you'd like to check it out, uh, we've got a link in the show notes uh, alongside the link to this article that we talked about today. Uh, please visit it. And if you feel inspired, become a patron. You can become a grumbler. You can become a super grumbler. Or you can become Rousseau's assassin, one of those <laughs> guys. And uh, we've got some people in each category now, and we're very grateful for that. You might support us through uh, you know, the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. And if that's the case, thank you for that and keep it up. Uh, those are great folks. We really are pleased to be part of that network. 
uh, then there are other ways too, and I won't go into all of those. But anyway, thanks for your time today. Uh, we know that you have other things to do, and maybe you're even doing them while you're listening to us. <laughs> but uh, we think it's great. Uh, we get emails from all over the world, really, uh, almost daily, from different people who've listened to the show and want to tell us what they think about what we're doing. And uh, it's just really gratifying to know that the Lord's used the show to help people out. But um, we're grateful uh, to the Lord and to you. So bye-bye to all folks in podcasting.